Hi, and welcome to our second unit of our course, our unit on matter in biological systems. And to start things off, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about where our atoms come from and where they go. We're going to talk about matter cycles. And I thought I'd start with this image, which shows the percentage composition of a typical human being by element. And so you can see that most of us by mass is oxygen, and then quite a bit of us by mass is carbon, and then, of course, We've got our hydrogen, our nitrogen, and then like 50 other trace elements. And we're going to talk about what all this means as we discuss this lesson. So the question that we're trying to answer in this video is where do our atoms come from? And so here we're going to talk a little bit really briefly about how the Earth got its matter. And then we're going to talk about matter cycles. We'll do the carbon and oxygen cycles, the nitrogen cycle, the phosphorus cycle, and the water cycle. Let's start by just reviewing where atoms come from. And so atoms are in fact made in stars. Stars engage in a nuclear fusion process and over the course of a star's life, all of the elements up to iron are made in that star. And when the star runs out of stuff to smash together, the star dies. And so it explodes in a supernova and that distributes all of the elements that is produced throughout its local area of the universe. And it also provides the energy necessary to take those atoms that it had made and smash them together even more to make everything heavier from iron up through bismuth. These clouds of matter do a variety of things. In the case of us, they gave rise to our solar system and the Earth. And so that's really how the Earth got a good portion of its matter. Some of the matter has been delivered through things like asteroids and comets hitting the surface of the Earth since then. But for the most part, all of the atoms on the Earth were delivered in that initial creation of the Earth at the beginning of our solar system. This is a chart just for your reference so that you can compare the percentage of elements in humans compared to other parts of the Earth, like the atmosphere and the Earth's crust. And you can see that in life, those percentages are different. And so that would suggest that living systems are doing things. They're engaged in processes that are resulting in this differential between the percentage of elements that we find in living systems as compared to the rest of the Earth. And we'll talk a lot about those processes over the course of both this unit and following units in this class. One point I want to make before we talk about matter cycles is that the elements that make up living systems are incredibly common in the universe. So here's a periodic table, and I'm just going to go ahead and spotlight the elements that are shown in this diagram. I did not spotlight the trace elements, but you can see here that these are some of the most common, some of the lightest elements in the universe. There's really nothing all that special about the elements that living systems use. So now let's get into it and talk a little bit about the various matter cycles that living systems are a part of on the Earth. And so before we do that, just understand that in any matter cycle, we're going to have a movement from some sort of non-living or abiotic reservoir into the biosphere of the Earth. And by the biosphere, we're really talking here about the food chain. Some organism is going to intake those elements from the abiotic reservoir, and then other organisms are going to get access to those elements by eating each other. There are going to be a series of processes that take matter from the abiotic reservoir and bring it into the biosphere, and then there's going to be a series of processes that return that matter from the biosphere back into the abiotic reservoir. The specific details in terms of what the reservoir is and what those processes are are going to vary depending upon the substance, but it's a good idea to focus on the sort of overall plan here before we get into the specifics. So with that, let's talk about some of the specifics. We'll start with the carbon and oxygen cycle. So the abiotic reservoir for carbon and oxygen that living systems have access to is the atmosphere. Oxygen exists as O2 and carbon dioxide exists as CO2. And I've color coded them here in order to track the processes that are going to bring them into and take them out of the biosphere. Those processes are metabolic processes. Specifically, respiration is going to be one process that's going to take oxygen out of the atmosphere for use in biological systems. And photosynthesis is going to be the main process that takes carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and incorporates it into biological systems. Inside of the biological system, it's going to work its way through the food chain. And these atoms are going to be incorporated into what we call the biological macromolecules, which we'll talk quite a bit about in a few lessons. Oxygen that's used in respiration will also be incorporated into water. 
Metabolic processes are going to take these molecules out of the food chain and bring them back to the abiotic reservoir of the atmosphere. Notice that they're opposite here. So respiration is going to take carbon dioxide out of macromolecules and return it to the atmosphere. And photosynthesis actually takes oxygen out of water and returns it back to the atmosphere. It's important to understand that even though I have the biotic reservoir simplified as a food chain, we're missing a lot of the internal cycling in there. And we've left out things like decomposers, for instance. Moving on, let's talk a little bit about the nitrogen cycle. And so the abiotic reservoir for nitrogen is the same that it was for carbon and oxygen. It's the atmosphere and nitrogen exists in the atmosphere as N2. It's actually most of the atmosphere. And for the most part, living systems can't do anything with those N2 molecules because they are incredibly stable the way they are. It's very difficult to break the bonds between them, but they are incorporated into the food chain through the process of nitrogen fixation. And nitrogen fixation is largely accomplished through the action of nitrogen fixing bacteria that live in the soil and live in the roots of some plants. These bacteria are able to take atmospheric nitrogen, N2, and convert it into a series of biologically useful forms of nitrogen. We're not gonna get into the details of those transitions for the purpose of our understanding for this course. Once it's in the food chain, it's incorporated into biological molecules, specifically protein, DNA, and RNA. And then nitrogen can be returned back into the abiotic atmospheric reservoir through the process of denitrification, which is accomplished by a, another group of bacteria called denitrifying bacteria when living systems excrete nitrogenous waste or when they pass away and are decomposed. The phosphorus cycle has some interesting differences compared to the cycles that we've talked about up till now. Specifically, the main abiotic reservoir for phosphorus is phosphate in rocks and in soil. And so this is released through the action of physical and chemical weathering processes that bring it into the soil and make it available to producer organisms who then incorporate it before it being passed on to consumers through the action of the food chain. Phosphates are found in a couple of different biological molecules, but specifically they're incorporated into nucleic acids, DNA, and RNA. When organisms excrete waste or pass away, that phosphate can be returned back into the abiotic reservoirs, and over the time scales necessary for the geological processes of the rock cycle to occur, can be once again incorporated back into the abiotic reservoir. And the last cycle that we're going to look at here is the water cycle. So this is not an elemental cycle. This is a cycle for a particular compound, which is which happens to be an incredibly important biological compound. The main reservoirs of the water cycle are the atmosphere and bodies of liquid water and the groundwater. Water is exchanged between these two reservoirs through physical processes, specifically precipitation and evaporation. But it can also be taken into biological systems from the liquid reservoir through the processes of biological water intake. So that would be things like photosynthesis, certainly, but also just drinking and incorporating water molecules into the biological system just through direct intake. It's important to understand that even though water is not an organic molecule, it is by far the most common molecule in all biological systems and biological systems are excellent at returning water back into the environment specifically through the processes of excretion and for producers transpiration of water from the soil through the plant and out through the leaves in gaseous form. So that's it for our discussion of matter and matter cycles. Thanks so much for watching. Make sure you can do the following things here at the end of our discussion. Make sure you can explain how matter cycles between living and non-living parts of the Earth's system. Make sure that you can describe the reservoirs and the biological processes that cycle carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and water. And also make sure that you can compare and contrast the matter cycles that we've discussed in this video. How are they similar to each other and how do they differ? If you can do all those things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment and write down any questions that you have so that you can get the answers that you need. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.